Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on uh, where you are in the country. My name is Michelle Deutschman. I'm the executive director of the UC National Center for Free Speech and Civic Engagement. I am pleased that you could join us today for our fourth of six Fellows in the Field workshops. As many of you know, each year the center selects between eight and 10 fellows from a broad range of disciplines and backgrounds, such as law, journalism, higher education, social science, technology, and government. Fellows receive funding to conduct research that will further the national conversation related to expression and democratic participation on college campuses. The Fellows in the Field series is an opportunity for the higher ed community to learn about the Fellows' findings and how they can be applied to your day-to-day -day work on campuses. My guess is that everyone joining us today has some familiarity with the quote-unquote crises on campus narratives that have flourished in the past five years. These are the headlines warning that faculty members are driven to indoctrinate students with their personal worldview, or that students censor themselves because it is not safe to share their viewpoints, or that students do not believe in the value of the First Amendment. Nick Havey and Dr. Elizabeth Nyhaus spent their fellowship years studying these types of narratives and exploring how they simplify complicated, nuanced issues that deserve focused attention and more than 280 characters. Nick is a fourth year PhD candidate in the Higher Education and Organizational Change Program in the UCLA Graduate School of Education and Information Studies. His research focuses on student political organizations, campus political climate, and political engagement. His ongoing political work considers the key predictors that explain why students change their political orientation over the course of college and how students across the political spectrum engage in campus political discourse. For his fellowship, Nick used big data from Twitter to construct and analyze the information networks of politically engaged students. His research aims to understand student information diets and how similar networks may impact student political identity and behavior. Beth is associate professor in the Department of Educational Administration at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Her current research focuses on how we can create and improve educational environments to facilitate student learning and development in higher education with a particular emphasis on the intersections of issues of free speech, academic freedom, and campus, cli campus climate. Dr. Nyhouse's fellowship project explored college students' moral reasoning around issues of free expression in the classroom. Through surveys and interviews, she examined students' judgments about others' classroom speech and how they make decisions about whether or not to share their own perspectives in the classroom. Beth and Nick, we're happy to have both of you here. I want to encourage our participants to drop questions into the Q&A. And with that, I'm going to ask Beth to sort of set the stage a little bit for us and um, give us a little overview of some of the simplistic narratives that the title of today's uh, webinar references. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so I just have a few slides, nothing uh, too in-depth, but to help frame the, the discussion here. Um, so as Michelle started to talk about in the intro to the webinar today, uh, there's this overall perception out there that college campuses are places that are hostile to speech and um, really to speech about certain ideas, often conservative ideas, and that this is leading to a crisis of so-called self-censorship on college campuses. Um, the idea is that college campuses are this leftist bubble where only liberal or progressive points of view are okay to express. Um, and although we see these narratives about ideological bubbles and self-censorship come through in both the education-focused and more general media outlets, um, these narratives aren't just harmless accounts of what's happening on campus. Um, flipping over to the next slide, um, as we've seen over the past few years and increasingly in the past few months, these narratives have led to pushback from groups like Turning Point USA uh, and their professor watch list, and more recently in efforts by the federal government, state legislatures, um, and at my own institution by our Board of Regents to address what they see as this crisis of ideological indoctrination um, and self-censorship by actually attempting to censor faculty and others on campus in various ways. Um, and although these efforts to control speech and viewpoints on campus are um, what I would say is a, a very misguided attempt to address what some see as this lack of viewpoint diversity and free expression on campus. Um, and as we'll discuss throughout this webinar, uh, this narrative about ideological bubbles and self-censorship is overly simplistic. Uh, this narrative doesn't come out of nowhere. So there are a number of surveys that have purported to find evidence of these crises on campus. Um, on the next slide, I have just one example um, to, to sort of help us understand this conversation a little bit. Uh, 
So FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, uh, recently put out a, a really interesting report where they ranked campuses based on the culture for free speech on campus. And one of the key questions on the survey they used to assess this culture for free speech was this item here where they asked students if they ever felt that they could not express their opinion on a subject because of how others might respond. And 60% said yes. Um, on its face, this is really concerning, right? Almost two thirds of students are so concerned about other people's reactions that they're afraid to share their opinions. Uh, but we don't actually know from this question and students' responses to it, what's happening? Um, does a student answering yes to this question actually mean that there's a negative culture for free speech on campus? Um, is this something that's happened to a student once? Um, is it something that the student themselves feel is a problem? Or is this really just students making common choices about how they approach discussions based on their audience? Um, there's so many questions <laughs> that this one survey item raises, um, yet none are really answered in this survey. Uh, there's other similar examples, but I wanted to just highlight one uh, to show how shaky the foundation of a lot of this narrative is, uh, particularly around self-censorship, which is my focus. Um, these surveys are obviously not the only source of this crisis, crisis narrative on campus, uh, but they're a major driver of the headlines. Um, and these surveys, by their nature, are really limited in what they can tell us about what's actually happening on campus and how students are really engaging with different viewpoints or making decisions about whether or not to speak up in different contexts. Um, yeah, the crisis narrative that it fuels um, is uh, you're really leading to attempts at multiple levels to control the viewpoints and speech of folks on campus, uh, particularly, I would say, faculty who are often villainized in, in this narrative. Thanks so much. Um, we could probably just spend the whole time talking about the different narratives and the different surveys, but um, I am going to push us forward really quickly. I want to um, let everyone know that we are dropping a direct link to both Beth and Nick's research into the Q&A, and I want to make sure to let the people know that, yes, this is being recorded and will be on, available on YouTube later. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn sort of now that Beth has done such a great job of sort of setting the table for us, diving into your actual um, respective research um, and sort of what you found um, and maybe what, what was surprising or not. And I'm going to ask Nick to start. Sure, so um, thanks to Beth for setting the stage for both of us to describe our work. Um, my work is sort of directly in response to the issues that Beth identified um, regarding the lengths that we can go with survey research and sort of what's left out when we ask questions that prompt a lot more questions alongside them. So I used um, social media digital trace data from Twitter to basically collect information on, at this point, about 10,000 students across a nationally representative sample of colleges and universities in this country um, to look at the um, their political stances and also the information networks that they were engaging in. So, you know, if you're on social media and you're only retweeting CNN versus only retweeting Fox following um, that sort of thing. And I looked at how, um, the computational and um, more statistic. So basically I calculated political ideology based on um, a variety of use factors that contribute to a more um, dynamic calculation rather than just someone saying, I identify as X on a survey. Um, and I looked at how that data corresponded to what we see from surveys. And um, we'll talk about this more in a couple of questions, but basically the, the key takeaway from my research is that there is polarization, but it's not necessarily as big as some of the survey um, findings and some of the headlines that we showed a couple slides ago might purport. Most students are identifying and behaving as moderates, which has been consistent since the 50s. Um, institutional type does play a factor. So there are certainly places that are more highly liberal. There are certainly places that are more highly conservative. You know, if you look at the student bodies of a Berkeley versus a BYU or a Notre Dame, you're obviously going to see wildly different, um, you know, student behavior and student identity. But basically the takeaway is that students are 
not as polarized as we may think and that they share a huge degree of overlap with the news and information that they're consuming and the sort of networks that they're existing within. Um, conservative students tended to be a little bit more polarized when it came to the networks that they were in, but on the average, the um, sort of the, the news aggregate score was moderate for all students and it was for liberal students, it was more moderate than their specific positions. Um, but I'll talk about that a little bit more in context later. But for now, I'll just pass back to Beth because I know her research does a great job of contextualizing um, that. OK, I'm going to let you pass it back to Beth. But I also want you to think, Nick, about whether or not you were surprised by the findings. Um, and you can either speak to that now or wait. Sure. So I, I wasn't surprised by the findings. Um, I've done similar work with um, large scale survey data that UCLA collects. So um, if everyone's not familiar with the Higher Education Research Institute at UCLA, that might be a great place to look for data on this topic. But it's really not shocking um, when you look at, and for instance, in that research, you can look at the individual identity level variable of, I said I was liberal, or I said I was moderate. And then you look at responses to other questions of you know, policy issues that students might support. And there's a huge, disconnect in that data of students saying I'm X and then describing a policy platform that they support that really indicates that they're closer to Y. Um, so it wasn't shocking to me that the, the data, you know, sort of shook out in a pretty normal, more even distribution that doesn't show this high degree of polarization that are being captured in these, you know, crisis narratives. So, okay, thank you. All right, Beth, the baton goes to you. Thanks. So um, you know, I think my research is really complementary to Nick's in a number of ways. You know, Nick has this really awesome, huge data set of social media posts. And my research goes much more in depth with a much smaller group of students, but really to understand um, how students are making decisions about speech on campus. So I collected um, survey data and then also um, in-depth interviews with students um, starting out at one a uh, large public research institution, although I started to collect data at a second, very different institution and I'm finding very similar things thus far, at least, um, to what I found in this initial pass. Um, one caveat that I do wanna say about my research is that um, in part of the interviews um, that I'm, I'm not really talking about today, because it's a little bit, it, it's on a slightly different theme. Um, the, we talked a lot about uh, racist speech in the classroom or potentially racist speech in the classroom. And so my research focuses um, on white students and what, how white students are navigating these questions, at least initially, um, because students with different racial identities are likely to um, navigate especially racialized speech in the classroom very differently. So I do want to give that caveat um, before I jump into what I found. Um, but in talking about what, what I actually found from the research, on um, the survey, I asked students a question that's actually really similar to the FIRE survey that I talked about a minute ago, um, but specific to speech in the classroom. So I just asked them, how often do they keep an opinion related to class to themselves? Because they were worried about potential consequences of expressing that opinion. Um, and what I found from that survey, it was very consistent with a lot of the other surveys out there. The vast majority of students said that yes, they at least sometimes did this. And there were trends where conservative students were more likely to say that they did this more often than more liberal leading students. Um, where my project really gets interesting though is in those follow-up interviews. Um, because in the follow-up interviews, I found that um, this is actually something that everyone does. I interviewed two students who on the survey said, no, I never, I never hold back in class. And then when I like asked them about it in an interview, they came up with plenty of examples of when they actually had done this. Um, and I, you know, I really found very little correspondence between what students had said on that survey and whether or not they could come up with specific examples of when this happened. And students who said that they um, you know, often or always hold back opinions in class, but couldn't come up with specifics of when they had done that. They're just like, yeah, generally, that's kind of how I approach classroom discussions. And then, you know, other students who had very, very concrete examples. So um, it really sort of, that's just one piece of, of complexifying that narrative around um, what these surveys tell us about students' decisions about speech. Um, and when I really dug into these decisions, you know, I, I found it, it is complicated. 
Um, you know, despite the fact that this idea of self-censorship can seem fairly, fairly straightforward, right? You choose to speak or you choose not to speak. Um, you know, what students were talking with me about, you know, is, is how they were carefully considering context, who they were speaking to, how they might communicate their points most effectively. Um, and, and a big part of it was whether it was really the time or place to try to share their opinions. And, you know, often it, in class, they just decided that wasn't the right time or place to have particular discussions or share particular opinions because of all of these factors that they were considering. Um, you know, there, what I found when I, I really dug into what were the factors that went into that decision? Is this the right time and place? Is this the right audience? Is this the right thing to say? Um, those decisions were shaped by the broader cultural context, by their personal experiences, and by a whole host of individual factors that you know, and all of these levels interacted in, in complicated ways. I, mean, I don't have time to get into like all of the different examples, um, but I did wanna highlight a few takeaways um, from you know, what students were telling me. Um, is, and one is that broader cultural context, which has to do with these narratives about polarization and cancel culture and self-censorship. Um, many, many students referenced these cultural narratives um, so that even if they didn't have personal experience with anyone responding negatively to something they had said or ever personally seeing something like that happen in class, they often anticipated that this would happen based on these broader cultural narratives. Um, and another key takeaway, um, for me at least, is that much of students, much of what students are grappling with when deciding what to say, when, how, you know, all of these questions are honestly just normal, natural things that we all think about when deciding whether it's the right time, place, or audience to discuss a particular topic. Um, yes, they care about what people think about them because they're in class with people who are part of their community. They're people they interact with regularly. Um, students don't want to seem like idiots by saying something that's just flat out wrong, right? But they're not fully confident that they know everything there is to know about a topic and so don't want to speak up and, and, and not be right. And they also don't want to offend people or hurt other people's feelings because they're just like normal people like all of us, right? If we're being honest with ourselves, this is what we all do. It's what we all think about. And in many cases, probably should. Right? We should be thinking about how our, our speech is affecting other people and at least taking that into account when we think about how we're going to approach communicating. Um, and this isn't to say that there aren't problems, um, that there aren't times when it's important to speak up and students or all of us feel like we can't for a variety of reasons, both good and bad, um, but it's way, way, way more complicated um, than these narratives um, that we typically hear in political or media discourse around the topic. Thanks, I, I think the theme for today could be like hashtag it's complicated um, because I think it really is. And you know, the three of us when preparing to for this webinar talked about how really an hour isn't sufficient time to really dig in. Um, but you've done a great job of kind of setting um, Nick up for the next question, which is that there are these narratives and your research is showing that perhaps those are overblown, but either way, what impact are these narratives having um, on campuses, um, whether that's on uh, students or on faculty? Nick, I'm going to let you kind of start there. Sure. So um, one of the biggest impacts that we're seeing within higher ed is just an impact on funding. Obviously, funding happens um, at both a state and a federal level for public higher education. And in states with um, you know, political leadership that strongly believe that campuses have such a powerful political skew and they're, you know, wildly outside of the diversity that's theoretically represented in the general population, we're seeing a lot of disinvestment and a lot of, um, you know, changes to funding, attacks on faculty, freedom of speech, attempted bans of things, um, sort of like Beth was indicating in the first couple of slides. And there is a good wealth of very recent research that indicates that empirically that when when there is that disconnect of you know the political leadership is perhaps conservative and the schools are being perceived in the state as overly liberal there is a funding imperative at the you know state level at the legislature level to either remedy that or just start slashing and so that's that's one of the tangible impacts that we're seeing but um Another more, you know, student level, interactions level impact that, you know, Beth can also speak to in great detail is that we're, we're allowing, we're 
we're basically facilitating students to buy into narratives that are not necessarily realistic or true. And those are not benefiting them in terms of, you know, creating social barriers where social barriers don't need to exist, you know, limiting class and social interaction on the basis of perceived reaction that hasn't happened or hasn't been documented as happening. Um, and really just cutting off productive discourse at the knees. You know, when, when we keep advancing this, you can't speak because, you know, your school is 95% one thing and you're that 5% that's just there. You know, we're not, we're not setting anyone up for success. And, um, you know, that's, I've, I've seen in a little bit of my other, you know, more qualitative research, like Beth was saying, you know, things centered on interviews with students, students that are just leaving institutions because they don't feel comfortable because they're running off of those, those narratives. And they're, you know, they maybe haven't experienced anything, but the fear of experiencing something is just shutting them down to a degree that is not great for, you know, general student engagement and, you know, topics like free speech and civic engagement. All right, thanks. And we are going to later today get to what we can do to be fostering the productive um, dialogue, but I wanna give Beth a chance to speak to, um, if you wanna add anything to material impacts, yeah, so um, I agree with everything <laughs> Nick said there. And, and you know, as he was talking about how um, these narratives shape how students interact with each other, and I was just thinking of all these conversations I had with students. And you think of one student in particular, um, you have a politically very conservative um, white male. I think he was you know, a junior, so he had, had a few years of experience in college. And when I asked him, Okay, you said that you very frequently hold back your opinion in class. Can you give me give me an example of, of when that happens so I can understand like what's going on, you know, when when you're making these decisions? And he had a really hard time coming up with specific examples. But what he had talked about was, well, I, I I hold back because I have an older brother. And he said that that this is what I should do because people will, you know start yelling at me and it'll just cause a lot of problems and professors will hate me and they'll give me bad grades and I was like well has that ever happened not to him I'm not saying that's never happened to anyone in the world that's that's not the argument I'm trying to make here but for this student he had no personal experience that would lead him to believe that him sharing his his more conservative points of view would lead to any negative repercussions in any of the environments he finds himself in but he was hearing from his older brother. He was hearing from his friends. He was reading in media outlets that as a conservative student, people like him self-censor all the time. And so he's internalizing that as this is something I should do. Um, and it caused him a lot of stress and a lot of anxiety around you know, how he could navigate classroom discussions. And I think other people in his classes were missing out on potentially interesting and important discussions. Um, he shared with me his, his long, you know, actually very well thought out, although I disagree with it, opinion on vaccination, on COVID vaccines. Um, and I think I understood the world better after having that conversation with him, even though I disagree with him, but he would never say that in class. Maybe if he did, it would go terribly for him. I don't know. But that's not what he was basing his decision on. He was basing it on these, these broader narratives. And you know, the other piece that I, I think in terms of material impacts are these policies that we're seeing um, go through state legislatures. Um, I referenced earlier on you know, the Board of Regents of the University of Nebraska, um, where I am, they had debated uh, a, a, a regents level policy prohibiting um, the indoctrination of critical race theory um, at the University of Nebraska campuses. And this is all really based on this problem, you know, really problematic narrative. Um, and I think the, the real problem, right, is that there, there is a problem, right? Students are feeling like they can't speak up in class and in other places on campus, but flattening that narrative to just, well, it's this ideological bubble, it's this indoctrination, that's not, fully what's happening. And so these policies that are trying to respond to this thing here that is this narrative, when what's happening is like this much bigger thing, it's not actually gonna help us have students like my one participant be able to more freely express themselves 
on campus and in the classroom. So we're just not going to fix it, right? That, that's this narrative is very much getting in the way of us addressing any real problems that are happening. Okay, Nick, do you have anything to add to that before we turn to a couple of questions from our uh, participants? Sure, I would just say that, um, you know, following what Beth was saying, that flattening of the narrative also flattens people's understandings of their own identities. And sort of, you know, when you say that there is a bubble and or that there are multiple bubbles, students in particular start to identify as part of those bubbles rather than seeing that actually they're probably, you know, have two hands in both bubbles. Um, and there is a lot more overlap. And so that's something that I've, that I see, you know, at a more quantitative, you know, data point level, but I've also seen in individual interview level, you know, conversations with students of, you know, when you, when you prompt them questions to say, you know, well, what are your thoughts on this? Like Beth was saying, or you hear some really long drawn out, um, you know, explanations of their beliefs on something. I've heard a lot of a lot of students describe that they are one particular position and then they talk about what they're actually interested in and it's like well that's maybe not a correct identification for you but like holding on to that identification might be holding you back and that's not great that's all I have okay no that's great um I'm gonna start with some of the questions in the queue one from an esteemed former center fellow john wilson who's asking about um, fire data that was recently released um, it talks about the percentage of students reporting self-censorship increasing from 60 percent in 2020 to 83 percent in 2021 um, but fire changed the question from quote have you ever felt quote to quote how often have you felt quote is self-censorship an inevitable part of life Beth, you had mentioned that before, or do responses to these questions reflect personal ideology or the wording of the survey rather than the crisis of censorship? That's a big question. I'll let either of you start. I'll start and I'll say yes, right? It reflects <laughs> all of those things. And that's the problem with it. I could like have a whole hour where I just like rant about the overinterpretation of these survey questions. But right, yes, the I'm not surprised that it went up when you change from a yes, no to a how often, because it gives people more room to um, say like, well, yeah, occasionally I do that. Um, or often I do that as opposed to like, yes, which feels like a very definitive always to a lot of people. So just in terms of like survey psychology and logic, it, it, it makes sense that that number would go up, it, even if nothing on the ground has, has changed. Um, I don't think you can compare those two numbers with this, the answer options being so vastly different. Um, but I think the important thing here is that um, self-censorship or, uh, so Carlos Cortez, who's also a former uh, center fellow, um, advocates for using the term self-editing as opposed to self-censorship. And I actually really like that. I use the word self-censorship in my work because it speaks to this narrative. Um, but really what we're seeing is, is this idea of self-editing. Uh, the thing that we all do because we're reasonable human beings who live in community with other people, we think about how our speech is going to come across to other people. And sometimes we decide not to say something because the cost benefit analysis is not, does not lean towards the benefit on the whole. Um, now, and that's why I think we really need to unpack this a lot more and understand more about what's going into these decisions, because there are times when we all self edit in ways that we probably shouldn't, where there are outside forces that are keeping us from speaking up when it would be important to share our perspective. But this is also capturing a whole bunch of really appropriate things that we want students to be learning how to do, right? This is stuff that I work with my, my four-year-old and my eight-year-old on is like, when do you say that thing? And when do you not, right? This is, but th these questions are capturing all of that. And that's really unhelpful. Nick, do you have anything to add? Otherwise I can go to another question. I would, I would just echo everything that Beth said. And, you know, obviously we've done some level of collusion um, because I was going to talk about self-editing as well. And just, you know, I just to throw another example out into the wind. Um, you know, I had a student who literally described like in class, I will say certain things, but I'm not going to list that I'm an intern for the RNC on my Tinder because I'm going to get far fewer swipes. And it's like, that's, is that self-editing or is that self-censorship? You know, who's to say? And so I agree with Beth that, you know, questions like that, again, 
flatten and make it hard to know what the actual response is going to be. Okay, I think a good follow up is a question from Terry, which talks about the escal escalation and I can't speak since sensationalization, there we go, of um, these incorrect narratives seems to be done intentionally and knowing that if they're incorrect or at least if they're oversimplified and sort of recognize you know, that there's some potential duplicity, um, her question, which just moved, um, is in the perpetration of the narratives, how do we combat it and or prevent the flattening and some of these detrimental effects? So I think we're starting already to get to the how, how do we? And then another person asked a really important question um, also to do with setting standards in classrooms about communicating. And I think those two things kind of go together is what is the responsibility, if any, of faculty to set standards or guideposts about communicating um, in the classroom? And again, I'll let either of you start with that. I don't mean to jump in all the time, but um, this was actually like one of what I was thinking through one of the implications of my research is that this idea of faculty setting standards, setting parameters, helping students understand how to navigate discussions in class, I think is, is huge. I mean, I don't know that I, I, I can say like morally faculty have an obligation to do this, but what I can say is it would be incredibly helpful to students. Um, so many students who I spoke with, um, yes, are afraid of being wrong. So faculty normalizing just being wrong is okay. Like making mistakes is okay. You're all here to learn um, would be helpful, but then also just setting parameters for class discussion would help students understand if and when and how they should be engaging in you know, potentially controversial controversial discussions and when that's not appropriate because they don't necessarily know how to navigate that, um, especially students who are earlier on like, you know, first year, second year students. Um, the other thing is I think we need to not only set the parameters, but help them understand how to engage um, constructively across different viewpoints. Um, because so many students are afraid of saying the wrong thing, but also saying it in the wrong way. They aren't sure how to express their perspective in a way that is helpful to the discussion, as opposed to just going to cause, you know, a huge blow up. And so even if they want to engage, they're not learning how to do this. At least most of the students that I spoke with aren't learning how to do this before college. And then we just throw them in and expect them to do it and do it well and be comfortable doing it. And then we criticize them when they either don't want to or do it poorly. Um, so I think just like we teach students you know, writing and we teach students how to do research and we teach students all of these skills that they need in their education, we also need to teach them how to have these, these conversations and how to express themselves um, constructively. Um, I don't know how we change the narrative. But I think there are things that we can do to help students deal with its effects. And I, I just want to echo that I so agree with you. I that's one of the things that I've always found frustrating, especially in my past work, I was working mostly with K through 12 students and teachers and administrators, and then moving into higher education and realizing that we're inculcating our, you know, young people with a lot of important values about using your words and speaking out when you see something that doesn't feel right or appropriate, but we're not necessarily giving them the other piece, which is that there are other responsibilities and rights that come with the First Amendment. And then you drop them off on a, you know, like I was dropped off at a Berkeley campus when I was 17 and I didn't know what had hit me. Um, and I also think that there is something to be said, and I don't know if either of you agree about this idea that rights go with responsibilities and that we're very, very focused on free speech rights, that we have the right to say something. And certainly like that's that's the work of the center is to safeguard those rights. But I do think that the balance of that is to be also teaching and thinking and writing and, and dialoguing about what is a responsibility to use that right well um, to benefit society, to think carefully, to use evidence, things like that. Um, so I'm going to let uh, Nick go ahead and kind of can touch on any of these things before we turn to other questions. Yeah, I was just going to, you know, totally echo that. I also agree that rights come with responsibilities. And one way of ensuring that, you know, as faculty or instructors are meeting those responsibilities is exactly what Beth was describing. And Carlos, this is a little bit to your question of just starting class, you know, at a day one level of these are my expectations for discourse and asking students their expectations and, you know, setting some ground rules that are a little bit more set in stone so that you don't encounter a situation where people 
um, you know, I've had this experience. People stop coming to class because someone said something, you know, in the interest of voicing their opinion and, you know, was not cut off or was not challenged or X, Y, Z by a faculty member that failed to set, you know, discourse expectations. And other students were so harmed by their use of a racial slur that they just stopped coming to class and dropped the class. And so, you know, you can, you can encourage difficult and contrarian opinions without enabling um, that sort of reaction and that sort of response by setting up very clear guidelines of, you know, we're all here to learn from each other, things along that. And, you know, I, I won't talk at length about that because there are um, dozens, if not hundreds of resources on, you know, setting those sort of guidelines. But it's a lot, my response is that a lot of this is just pre-work and it's pre-work at the, you know, individual level of if you're a faculty member and you think that you're going to come in and, you know, have to have these more difficult or challenging or contrary to your position conversations, just even acknowledging that you, that you probably yourself already have bias and you need to, you know, come into the class with an open ear that maybe you didn't get to develop as an undergraduate because, you know, we weren't having these conversations and whenever you were educated. Not, not everyone gets to, you know, take free speech law, so. That's true, and that's a shame. No, I'm just kidding. Um, okay, a lot, a lot more questions coming in. Um, you know, oh, another person um, asking about feeling skeptical about whether these issues are mainly about narratives um, and pointing to real changes that are happening on campuses as well. A uh, recent study in the American Sociological Review shows a sharp rise in moral absolutism among college students, and most notably on the left rather than the right. Um, the Harry data that Nick had talked about before at UCLA indicates that 20 to 30 percent of faculty in arts, humanities, and social science identify as far left or radical. Um, and what Steve is saying is this is a minority, of course. My observation is that these folks tend to be better organized and more vocal than, you know, moderate academics. Um, he's saying, of course, there's no excuse for the efforts of state legislatures to attempt to constrain academic freedom, um, but sort of, you know, is there another element that's not just about the narrative, but it's actually changes in higher ed? Yeah, Nick, you don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> Sorry, just reflex. Hi, Dr. Brent. Um, great question. Yeah, so as, as, I, as we were discussing earlier, you know, survey data is not perfect. Um, you know, as a preview to other center um, projects, I am engaging in a similar, you know, computational project regarding faculty. And even with a smaller sample of about 2,000 faculty members currently, I'm showing that a lot of faculty that might say, you know, I'm the most liberal there is, and then have an opinion, um, are actually a lot more aligned with moderate center right, right political orientation. And so my, my immediate response to that is that I don't think that those surveys are accurate. And I think that relying on, um, you know, narratives that have been produced on very lowly representative um, survey data, you know, Harry is great, but it's not perfect. It's not a nationally representative sample. There's obviously things like survey um, response bias and self-selection. And traditionally, the faculty survey tends to be, um, you know, whiter, older faculty members at liberal arts colleges. And so it's already a really skewed set. And to add to that, it's a lot of people that think that they're far left or radical, and maybe they were in the 60s when they first started out, but they're, they're not now, and they're, those positions are really, you know, uninterrogated. And so I would, I would sort of push back on, you know, that data isn't very good, and it's also not very realistic with what we're seeing. Um, one thing that I would say is that, you know, with your, with your own experience interviewing traditional academics that they feel uncomfortable expressing their views, um, I, would, I would, again, push back on the concept of traditional academics as being more moderate. Um, that's very field specific and, you know, problematic in its own right, but um, there's a difference, again, as we discussed in the last couple of questions between feeling empowered and feeling and actively being silenced or censored. If you're not talking because you, you're not going, so this is a horrible example, but um, if anyone watched the chair recently, there were faculty members who didn't get invited to things because they made people uncomfortable, and so it might be more of a situation of, it's not that you're uncomfortable expressing your views, it's that you're doing that self-editing so that you can maintain a collegial um, bound. And we've seen that in you know, conservative in investigations into faculty political dynamics, you know, passing on the right, 
Shields and Dunn, Gross and Simmons. Sorry to just be listing references now. But um, yeah, my, my response to that is I, I disagree. Okay, thank you. Uh, now we have, um, I'm so pleased that everyone is so engaged um, in our um, audience today. Um, another terrific former fellow, Lara Schwartz, is asking about, has anybody addressed the interplay of radicalization and self-editing? Example, if a student believes a demonstrable falsehood, like the election was stolen, vaccines cause infertility, wouldn't we expect them to feel hesitant to express their belief in an academic setting? So to my knowledge, no one has directly looked at this yet, at least that I've seen. There's oodles of research out there, so I don't purport to have seen all of it. Um, but I don't, I don't know that I've seen this addressed directly. There's some things that might indirectly point to this phenomenon, like um, you know, the fact that you know, sort of there's this relationship between political um, identification and um, you know, purported self-censorship or, or self-reported self-censorship. So there might be some of that, that going on. Um, you know, the, I'm trying to think about like the students I spoke with, the only, the only one who raised an issue in the interview that would, would fall into this, you know, potential radicalization category was the student who talked about vaccine hesitancy, but honestly his vaccine hesitancy was not based in, um, you know, misinformation or falsehood. I, I disagreed with his cost benefit analysis, but he actually, you know, he wasn't referencing any of these like way out there, you know, vaccine cause infer infertility things. So I don't know that I can speak to this for my research and I don't know that people have looked at this yet. I think we might expect there to be a relationship. Um, and it, there was one student who talked about, have, uh, you know, not liking that their professor for an assignment um, gave them a list of acceptable sources to use. Um, but that was sort of the only thing that might speak to, well, I'm getting my information from different sources than my, my faculty are. Um, so I think it's a good question. This is my sort of long rambling answer to it's a good question, but I don't know that we have a, a, a research-based answer to it yet besides the gut feeling that, yeah, like that makes sense. Well, it might be an, an opportunity for someone to apply to be a fellow at the center and research that. Um, okay, then Nick, the next question I have, I think is gonna go to your work. It's from Jazz. It's about student anxiety about saying the right thing on campus, um, e.g. conforming to, I just disappeared off my screen, conforming to a perceived political norm. Um, is that a universal phenomenon across institutional type? For instance, does that student anxiety exist as deeply at community colleges as at four-year universities? Um, institutional type likely correlating with student profile and demographics. And I know that your research, um, you, you covered a wide swath of universities in different areas and of different sizes and makes. So um, I'll let you take that. Yeah, so thanks for that question, Jazz. Um, I would say that it's obviously very different. Um, you know, student bodies across different institutional types have varying degrees of political engagement. Unfortunately, most of the research that we've seen done on sort of student political behavior and, um, you know, now student political identity. So things like Becoming Right, a great Amy Binder and Kate Wood book, um, for anyone interested, is, and including my own work and Beth's work, is that there, this research is often, um, you know, single site and at very specific institutional types. And oh, I accidentally muted myself. Um, it's hard to say if that's true. One thing that I can say from my own research is that a, there appears to be a greater degree of polarization at more selective institutions, and that may just be because um, those students are more politically engaged or more vocal, or there is just more opportunity to be politically engaged and vocal, whereas at something like a community college, you know, there probably isn't a, you know, student political union that's hosting monthly or bi-monthly debates, or, you know, maybe there isn't a student newspaper. And so institutional facets might be um, influencing that of whether or not there is that sort of saying the right thing, conforming to a perceived political norm, difference across institutional types. Um, my, my quantitative data suggests that there might be, but that's definitely a, a question for future, you know, more in-depth work, but thank you. Okay. Um, we still have time for some more questions. Um, 
one of the things that I, I want to raise that was um, asked by one of our attendees um, has to do with how students are factoring um, in the cost benefit analysis, potentially grades or the impact that what they say and how they say it will impact, um, you know, how they do in a particular class and did either, especially in, in Beth, in your case, did you find that coming up? Uh, yes, that was definitely something that's, that, that some students at least were, were taking into consideration. Um, of the students that I spoke with, none of them had ever had an experience where they were penalized um, in a class or with a grade or by a professor in any way. I'm not saying that has, again, not saying that has never happened in the world. Of course it has. There are a lot of professors and students out there and some of them do awful things. Um, but none of my none of the students in my survey had that direct experience, um, or none of the students in my interview had that direct experience. Um, nor could they um, think of anyone who they knew who had directly had that experience. Um, and this is one of the things that pointed to that the way that the narrative influences their decisions. Even lacking that that direct experience, they anticipated that that was a possibility, um, and a pretty strong possibility. Um, to the point that some students said, you know, that they had written papers in class that they didn't believe one bit and just thought it was what the professor wanted to hear because they just wanted to get a good grade and just didn't care. They were there for the grade. They didn't, they weren't really interested in challenging the professor's point of view, um, but they had no, no concrete basis on which to say like, hey, I might actually get a bad grade if I if I still wrote a good paper, but did said something that disagreed with what the professor, you know, presumably thought. Now again, I don't have any evidence one way or the other that in those situations they would or wouldn't. All I can say though is that what they were basing their decision on was their assumption that was based on what they were hearing from other people. Nick, I know you wanted to add something to this. Sure. So I was I was just going to point out that someone people have empirically answered this question and found that um, in an experimental study of I think a couple thousand students and faculty members that there were not really any clear influences on grading with respect to you know partisan conversation in class and that when there were it was actually um, liberal students were more likely to be penalized by conservative faculty members or instructors. Um, and that was the only significant finding. So I would I would say to echo Beth's point that there's a lot of talk about it, not a lot of concrete evidence, and then um, that the concrete evidence shows that it's not really happening. Okay, we have a question from Emma about whether the study of research on student self censorship or self editing um, is that real like a relatively new field um, or how far back does it go and are there kind of identifiable trends or we're still studying to figure out what those trends are. So john Wilson actually posted an interesting uh, question in the in the Q and a that. The beginning of it answers this question a bit. Um, John says that surveys of Americans reporting self-censorship um, have increased from 13% in uh, 1954 to 40% in 2019. Um, so it does sound like there are, is at least some survey data that goes back um, to, to 1954. The survey data that I'm most familiar with um, goes back, you know, a few years at this point. Um, I'd have to look up when the first like Gallup Knight Foundation um, survey data came out and FIRE has been doing their survey for a few years now. Um, so there are some, some trends over time um, based on those surveys, um, but I would just circle back to the point that I've made throughout this webinar that I don't know that you can actually take what those surveys say and identify a trend in actual student self-censorship um, because I think those surveys are capturing a lot. Um, they're capturing problematic self-editing behavior. They're capturing um, self-editing behavior that we'd really want to see. And they're capturing the way that students do or do not identify with the self-censorship narrative. So even if students aren't doing this very frequently, they might answer that they are because they identify with the narrative that students like them are doing that. 
Um, so often these self-report surveys capture a lot of noise. And I think these questions in particular, because of these broader cultural narratives, just capture a lot of that noise. So I would not trust <laughs> the trends over time that these surveys might identify because of that noise. And that noise has increased over time. Um, these narratives have gotten stronger and students' um, identification with the narratives have probably gotten stronger over time. Um, and so to what extent is this measuring behavior versus that, I don't think we can tell. And I would, I would say that I mostly agree with that. And just that there, there certainly exists, you know, older research on this topic, but it's very tangential or, you know, secondary. So it'll be, there's a lot of research in sociology about students' perceptions of, you know, not, not fighting a war in Vietnam and, you know, whether or not they feel like they can talk about that or divestment from South Africa and things like that, where it's, it's sort of a back burner question, but it does exist. And I would say that my, my response is similar to Beth's, that there's, there's a more recent, you know, the last five, maybe 10 years focus on actual, you know, student self-editing and student self-censorship, but the, you know, more tangential descriptive pocket of, you know, is there a skew? Do student politics match faculty politics? Stuff like that have existed for decades. Okay, I think we have time for a, um, a final question and then I'm gonna give each of you a chance, um, not just to wrap up, but to sort of leave us with some thoughts about what all of us can do, especially as we are all, or many of us returning to the classroom and the office, right? Um, in this week, um, in the coming weeks or already there. Uh, Carlos um, asks um, about whether either of you um, looked into trigger warnings and in what sense do you think they contribute to or obstruct constructive dialogue um, about difficult issues among college students? I did not look into this directly, um, but I can say what I think my research points to in terms of trigger warnings. Um, so first I would say, you know, there is research on trigger warnings and people who have experienced trauma and that is way outside of my wheelhouse. Um, but I think that that's, you know, one piece of it. And I would, I would direct people to, you know, Google that, that research if you want to understand the, the relationship between trigger warnings and, and how those do or do not help people who have experienced trauma. In terms of just a general pedagogical practice, I think it's a good idea, whether you call it a trigger warning or not, to let students know what to expect so that they can be prepared for it. Um, because that is what's going to make them more likely to speak up is if they feel like they have a solid foundation for, to work from. Um, so if they know that a particular discussion is coming and they want to contribute to it and they want to participate in it, they can prepare for that, both in terms of like doing the reading for class if they really care about what's, what's going to come next, um, which of course they always do. Um, or just like mentally and emotionally preparing for that discussion. So I think, you know, I wouldn't call it a trigger warning because that triggers people. Um, but I would just say it's like good pedagogical practice to let your students know what to expect so that they can be prepared to, to do whatever it is that you expect of them. Exactly what Beth said. And I would just add that I double agree that it shouldn't be, I, I would not say the phrase trigger warning because it's at this point coded language that allows um, for, you know, side discourse that's not necessarily productive. And just circling back to what we were talking about earlier that, you know, preparation and just setting ground rules and guidelines and, you know, providing as much information as possible in the interest of, a, you know, productive discussion is really the, the response to that of, you know, not, not saying, you know, today we're going to talk about X, Y, Z, and surprise, this is your warning. You know, that's maybe not the best, but, you know, setting students up and setting your, setting the instructors up for success is really the, the best way to go about that. And like Beth said, there's a whole host of research on the utility of that that we can't necessarily speak to, but at an instructional level, exactly um. what you said. Well, we worked hard to get through as many questions as we could. I know there are some that are we cannot get to, but um, Beth and Nick have been generous enough to offer to continue the conversation with anybody who would like, whether that's online. And if people really think there's more to dig into, which I think there is, we can certainly do a follow-up. I do wanna give our panelists a moment to sort of circle back to what we can do. Um, really at the core um, of all of this is, is open inquiry and robust dialogue and, you know, literacy and misinformation and how we learn. Um, these are, you know, 
at the core of higher education. And so I'd like to ask each of you to maybe close with just a couple of things that you would like to send people off um, back into the campus world to think about after today. Go ahead, Nick. I would just say that, um, you know, the really the, the bare bones of what my research for this fellowship indicates is we have a lot more in common than we do, you know, difference and relying on emphasizing that difference might not be in the best interest of, you know, finding common ground and facilitating things like free speech, academic freedom, civic engagement, you know, positive classroom interaction um, and working, working to, to create environments that protect people that are, you know, going to be harmed by more inflammatory political rhetoric is important, but there's, there's also room to allow people to voice their concerns without completely shutting down. So I don't know if that's at all a response to what you asked. But. I think so. All right, Beth, you get the last word. Well, then I get the last word, but. So I think just a couple of points I'd like to leave people with. One is that, um, you know, I'd encourage folks to, to think critically about these narratives and about the, the media reporting on things like self-censorship on campus to recognize that, yes, there are issues that are going on, but, um, sort of this like knee jerk crisis reaction actually can make the problem worse in a lot of different ways and doesn't help us actually solve the problem. I mentioned this earlier, but I think it's worth repeating that I think we need to be much more intentional as educators about teaching students how to engage constructively across difference and um, to engage with different ideas, to express their own ideas in a constructive way because that will help them be more confident doing so um, make them more likely to do it and make them much more likely to do it in an actually constructive way. Um, and then the last thing is, um, and I, I haven't really gotten a chance to talk about this aspect of it yet, um, but I think we need to be thinking about all of this um, from a college student development lens. Um, in my research, I really found, um, and, and this is in part because my background is college student development, but like in every conversation with students, I was hearing things about, you know, how they understand knowledge and learning, how they understand their sense of self and their own personal and social identities and the way that they navigate their relationships with others, which is the classic like cognitive intrapersonal and interpersonal development lens. And I think that that can be so helpful um, in actually getting at what's holding students back from speaking up. Um, rather than just like shouting about indoctrination and ideological bubbles and self-censorship. Um, let's really try to understand what's going on with students and let's use what we know about promoting really positive student development to um, actually help with this problem as well. Because I think that that's actually a productive path forward. Well, Beth, I feel like you stole my conclusion, but um... I, I really wanna thank, first of all, both of you for taking your time to really thoughtfully unpack your insightful work. And then I think I was gonna do sort of what Beth suggested, which is that as we head back to our workspaces, um, I just wanna encourage each of you to think about when we choose to speak and when we don't, and then some, spend some time exploring why we made that choice, right? Um, same for information. When do you click? When do you just glance at a headline? When do you read the whole piece? Um, I think if we start individually in assessing kind of how we behave, hopefully that will contribute to improving um, the ability for us to communicate across difference um, in higher education. Um, next week, we have another Fellows in the Field next Friday. Please mark your calendars. Um, we're gonna be discussing free speech, civic and political engagement of undocumented students at the University of California. We're gonna be joined by um, a student activist uh, who represents the Undocumented Student Coalition. We're going to be joined by um, a former head of the UCI Dream Center and, of course, our fellow Ernesto, who spent his year studying these issues um, for the center. So in the meantime, I want to wish everybody a great west rest of their week and thank you all for joining us and hopefully we'll see you um, a week from Friday. Bye. <laughs>